by His grace. It would be even better, of course, if He would come that second time and take us all to uh, the marriage feast in heaven. We look forward to that. In the meantime, happy anniversary, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when you think about it, it wasn't the brightest idea to be married on the 30th of December. <laughs> There was no room at the inn. <laughs> Heard that one before? And indeed, we spent our first night in the back seat of a mini minor. <laughs> by the lake. Yeah. 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 The motel had doubled. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, <laughs> now let me, tell, let me hear your stories. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, as we begin, as we begin, it might be good to begin with prayer, uh, as we contemplate the past, as we reflect on the year just gone, maybe the 46 years to Joan and I, and uh, make resolutions, contemplate, meditate on what 2019 might hold for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your mercy, and indeed we come to the mercy seat. We beg your help to live our lives appropriately before you and before our fellow men. Help us to understand what you have for us, and we pray in Jesus' name, of course. Amen. Indeed, the reason why we, that we have in church the sermon at the end is so that people who don't want to hear the sermon can leave early. So if anybody... <laughs> Carolyn, yeah, okay. Uh, I, you've got the notes. You can take them home and do it at your leisure. That's why I've done this. I wanted to make sure that uh, nobody could get away with, uh, well, with weak Christianity for a change. I mean, the preacher does all the work all week. He's mulling over what he's going to say, and you guys sit for 20 minutes and feel bored. <laughs> well, I hope that's not the case. Uh, uh, you too. Uh, are uh, eager to hear what the Lord has to say. Sorry about the preacher. I mean, that's another story, isn't it? But uh, yeah. you've got to put up with him occasionally. So I'm just wondering, should this really then be a New Year's message? I mean, do you uh, preach appropriate to the occasion, whether it's Mother's Day or Father's Day or Christmas or New Year's weekend? Should it be a year of reflecting on the year just gone? A lot of the uh, TV shorts, you know, you'll get reflections on what happened. You get uh, you know, clips of uh, uh, some of the scenes of 2018. But we want to put the past behind us, of course, and we want to make a fresh start in a fresh year by God's grace. That's a tall order, of course, because we are still human beings prone to weakness and prone to failing in our New Year's resolutions. But we'll try, won't we? So I'm asking four questions this morning to help us to get it all in perspective and in focus. And the first one, of course, is really a rehash of uh, a sermon that I preached here a couple of weeks ago, about three weeks ago, was it? Yeah. Uh, celebrities we have met. Some of you have met a few celebrities, not just seen them, but actually spoken with them. And I mentioned Wes Hall when I was at high school, that cricketer from the West Indies who was able to throw a cricket ball over the Kingaroy peanut silos. And uh, since then there's been a few others as well. And I forgot to mention Bindi Irwin. And if you'd like to turn to the back of your... Uh, oh, no, the bottom of it. Back of it? Bottom of it the back of it. You'll find uh, a picture of Bindi Irwin straight from winning Dancing with the Stars in the United States and she brought her boyfriend partner out to show off her Australia Zoo. And we happened to be there with our two grandsons at that day and we were following them around. Oh, that's Bindi Irwin, <laughs> Stalking. we said. Yeah. Stalking. Yeah, well, we actually did catch up with Bindi and she obliged she by sitting with one of our grandsons who was all a god. Oh, fancy having my photo taken with this great star, Bindi Irwin. Well, 
<laughs> there's Tyson in the background, none the wiser. I, I could have sat there with Bimby and had my photo taken. Yeah, we'll anyway, just have to prove you matter. <laughs> it's probably best this way. Um, but that's by the by the by, really, isn't it, uh, Carolyn? Who that's wants to be a star? Who wants to be with a star? Yeah. Well, we we had a star, didn't we, on uh, uh, Carol's night? Thank you for the way you emceed with your <laughs> very very poor wit. You know, you know it was terrible, wasn't it? Yeah. No, we appreciate exactly. it. It was really good, uh, Carolyn. I aim to please. Uh, but when it comes to celebrities, well, what of it? I mean, they're uh, here one minute, well, it was about, about a minute we spent with Bindi Irwin, and I think uh, I probably uh, spent an hour with Wes Hall and uh, Sheikh Shakabut, had a cup of tea with Sheikh Shakabut in the desert, the Arabian desert, uh, for an hour or so, and then he's gone, they're all gone, and didn't make much difference, just good, pleasant memories. That's all we've got to remember our celebrities, except, of course, the favourite celebrity that I want to talk about this morning, we've already mentioned him many times throughout this service, his name is Jesus. And the very name means Jehovah saves. Well, we don't pronounce it as Jehovah anymore, do we? It's Yahweh. The uh, grammatical experts have found out that we've been, been pronouncing God's name wrong all these years. And in fact, the Hebrews never pronounced it at all. That's why you've got capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in your Bible so often where the name Jehovah or Yahweh is mentioned, the Hebrews refuse to pronounce it as too holy, so they substitute Adonai, which translated into English is Lord. Well, Jesus certainly is Lord. He is Yahweh. He is the I Am, the author of life. It's Him we celebrate, of course. And, uh, of course, the quest for meaning goes on until we truly learn to celebrate Jesus. I've been reading Alistair McGrath's book, The Great Mystery. Well, I read a chapter or two, and I sit there with my computer on, and I summarize it as I go, and then put the book down, somebody else gives me another book and I'm reading that. Well, it's been a while since I picked up Alistair McGrath, and I did the other day, and uh, made, he made these observations. It's as if we were adrift on a great misty grey sea of ignorance, seeking a sun-kissed island of certainty. He talked about the 20th century with two world wars, and it seems, he said, as if paradise has been deferred yet again. So you see, he, what he is saying is, we can't find meaning simply in the world around us. There's got to be much more. This island paradise that we're uh, seeking seems so elusive, and people simply drift on in life without asking questions of meaning. Except, and I'll come to the except a little later on. The Irish writer, I quoted him for you, John Banville, he talks about that chilling, I, mention, I, I say chilling, Greek allegory of people facing the grave. He speaks of them stepping into Sharon's boat to be ferried across the river Styx, the Sty in Stygian darkness, to the place of the dead without having figured out what life was all about in the first place. We don't want to go there, do we? We don't want to miss the boat, the other boat, that is, of course. We don't want to go anywhere near the river Styx or whatever else hell might be described as. We want to find meaning. And as McGrath says, it does seem that we are born to wonder, after all, what, one, what life is all about, uh, not merely to exist. And so I hope it's your quest, as it is mine, to find out more and more and more and more of what life is really all about. People really are seeking meaning, but not very seriously a lot of the time. 
all too often that search gets more earnest in our brokenness. I thank God in my case that it wasn't in brokenness, it was simply that an Aboriginal workmate up at Gallon Gown, uh, an hour and a half, two hours northwest of here, started sharing and boring me with his Bible studies and reminded me that if there is God, I would be foolish to ignore him and therefore I sur surrendered my life to his <coughs> will there and then in that forestry barracks at the end of May 1969, a long, long time ago for some of you sitting here. Hard to remember that far back, hard to appreciate that far back for some of you. But when you come to people like Ron, well, I'm in the youth group. <laughs> oh, sorry, Ron, you're, you're so good, uh, But we, in, and I thank God that it was uh, at that particular point in my life. If I had waited until a point of brokenness, I would have simply despaired, knowing me. And uh, like a lot of people who get broken about loss of a marriage or grief or loss of a job or something, what do they do? They resort to drugs or drink, and even worse. But some, in their brokenness, think, well, there's got to be an answer. There's got to be more to life. And they start seeking out answers, and they find Jesus. Well, praise God for Jesus. He's there. But when we find Jesus, other questions still hound us, do they not? All of our problems are solved when we meet Jesus? No, I would suggest that in many cases, they've just begun, as uh, we will suggest in a moment. Those troubles that are hounding us are like the sheepdog nipping at our heels to point us in the right direction. It's all about the Garden of Eden experiment extending on into the, the history of humanity. Because there was more to the Garden of Eden, thou shalt not, than just simply eating the fruit and paying the price, being punished with death. No, God, who knows everything, knew the end from the beginning. He wasn't taken by surprise by the fact that Adam and Eve fell into disobedience, fell the temptation of Satan in the form of the serpent. Indeed, he met them after they did that, didn't he? If you remember Genesis 3, he met them. And he asked them, Where are you? Well, I wonder if that's the tone of voice that he asked me. Where are you? No. <laughs> I think he just simply asked them, Where are you? What are you doing? Own up. You know, we have to sometimes answer questions that God puts to us, don't we? And we have to come to terms with where we are before God. As they had to. Well, in their case, they were hiding. And that's what prompted the question, who can hide from God? As we read in Psalm 139, verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I hide from your presence? Adam and Eve certainly found out that they couldn't hide from God. That we read in the previous, uh, in a couple of verses of chapter 3, after they had eaten that forbidden fruit, their eyes were opened and they realized they were naked. Well, I don't think that would have been too bad. It was just husband and wife together. But there was more than that, wasn't there? There was God. And uh, indeed, if you look through the Old Testament of examples of guilt, the prophets uh, particularly refer to it in terms of nakedness. Nakedness and guilt seem to go together. They knew they had done wrong before God and they sought to hide their nakedness. And in fact, the fig leaves that they put on, 
as if they were going to hide much with big leaves, but anyway, they tried. Uh, they were just symbolic of a greater nakedness, a soul nakedness before God. Yes, they had sinned, and they knew they were doomed at that point. Yes, and where are we in relation to God is the New Year question I'm putting, I'm putting to you and I'm putting to myself. Where am I in relation to God? Oh, I wish I were much, much closer, but I stand here before you in my sinful humanity still, but I still seek God. I'm not trying to hide from Him anymore. Or am I? I must ask that question. So here are two more questions then. Why will you try to run from God? Ask yourself this question from time to time throughout the year ahead. Why will you try to run from God? Because, let's face it, we will from time to time, perhaps without even realizing it. I turn to the book of Jonah. Would you turn to the book of Jonah? Well, you don't know where to find Jonah, do you? Uh, I'm glad that we've got Val in the room with us because she knew the names of all the uh, deer, the reindeer that pulled Santa's sleigh. She was able to recite them, so I'm sure she could tell me where to find Jonah in the Old Testament. Uh, start off with Hosea. Where do we go? Well, I'm not going to put you on the spot, Val. I'm putting everybody on the spot, including me because I uh, wanted to refer, well, I had been reading. In fact, Joan had uh, got up uh, uh, half an hour, an hour later than me. That's pretty normal in our house. Uh, mind you, she goes to bed an hour or two later than me anyway. So as one preacher put it uh, when we were at Armadale, Hamlet a few years ago, are you owl or fowl? I had to confess to being foul. <laughs> I get up early. <laughs> uh, yes. And I was having a bit of a quiet time. It wasn't a particularly serious one. And Joan caught me. She said, And what's the Lord been saying to you? And I had to admit that He hadn't been saying anything very much at all to me. I'd been doing all the talking and the thinking up to that point. Uh, but then I did get to uh, open a daily Bible reading and it was about Jonah. And then I had to find it in the Bible. I knew, it, uh, I knew approximately where to look. Rob, you would be able to tell me what page it's on, wouldn't you? Uh, <laughs> the page numbers are all different. In different yeah, this is right. All right. You, there's your out. Uh, so what I had done, I went to the computer and did myself a bookmark. And isn't that a good idea? Why don't you do that when you get home? Because none of you have told me where to find Jonah yet. Uh, I made a bookmark and I stuck it up on the wall in front of my computer where I do most of my work and then started looking in my Bible and found that the... See, I, I Googled. Google can tell you anything. But it didn't tell me in the right order. I, I printed it out. I put it on a Word document. I printed it out and stuck it up on my wall and found out that they just, I don't know what, what or maybe it was a Catholic Bible, or, I don't know, maybe it was the old he, uh, Hebrew Bible, it wasn't the, the NIV, that's for sure. So I found out that Jonah comes after Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, and then Jonah, right in the middle of the minor prophets. You know the difference between minor and major prophets? Well, let's have a little bit of a Bible study here. The major prophets are only major. They're not any more major than the minor prophets, except that they were more tedious. They wrote a lot more. They were longer, uh, like a lot of my sermons are. Uh, one day I'll become a minor prophet and uh, preach short sermons. But anyway, in the meantime, uh, turn to Jonah. By now I've given you a lot of time to find Jonah in your Bible, but it's only two verses. The Lord came to Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. He says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. 
He went down to Joppa, got on a boat, and after paying the fare, he went on board and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. How foolish! Where can you hide from the Lord? Surely Jonah, a prophet of God, would have known you can't hide from God. Mind you, a lot of people do try to hide from God, do try to run from God, and I guess there's a little bit of guilt in all of us in that regard. I uh, still think of the time when uh, we were now refugees in Cyprus. We'd fled the uh, war in Lebanon, Joan and I, after uh, two or three years of service for the Lord there. We had to get out of the country. We finally made it to Cyprus and we were enjoying life in balmy Cyprus. Very British, uh, very easy going and we enjoyed the Greeks. And then one day one of the uh, mission leaders came to us and said, I want you to go to the Arabian Gulf. We had to be reassigned because we couldn't all stay as, mis as uh, refugees in the island of Cyprus, our paradise at the time. No, we had to be reassigned and it was suggested we go to the Arabian Desert. Horrors! I'd uh, read about uh, the Arabian Gulf in geography at high school and I remembered it gets to 50 degrees Celsius most days of the year out in the desert. And that was just the beginning. Sand everywhere. I like trees. <laughs> plant my forest there in the Arabian Desert. But anyway, we went. But even more pointed or poignant an illustration would be this. What say God would pick out Les, Les, I want you to go and preach to the ISIS soldiers in Syria. You know, the ISIS soldiers that, uh, well, they burn alive pilots that they've shot down. They uh, put petrol all over them, lock them in a cage, and then light a fuse. Well, that's the kind of people the Ninevites were when they captured their enemy. There's no difference. History keeps on repeating itself. And, that, and uh, of course, Jonah being a Jew, he was a prime target. Would you do what Jonah did and head to Nineveh and preach the gospel? Or would you get on a cruise liner and go to Tarshish in wonderful Spain? Oh, I guess we would all be tempted to do the latter, and many of God's people over the years have done just that. They've known God wanted them to do thus, 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 and thus, but they've done this, 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 and this. They are the poor. I was enjoying, we all enjoyed having Graham B. at our Bible study end of year celebration a few weeks ago. Graham B. was a missionary a reluctant missionary, as most missionaries start off being, very reluctant, missionary in Ghana, in Africa. He started off working as a teenager on a dairy farm, and he had aspirations of working on a dairy farm. He wanted to be a dairy farmer, but God had other ideas, and Graham balked at that for a long time. But eventually the Lord got him to come around, and he went to Bible College, the WEC College, in Lawn System in Tasmania and uh, from there uh, well after meeting his wife there uh, went to Ghana as a missionary and uh, he testified the other night <coughs> that he could have done that or he could have ignored the voice of the Lord and set himself up as a dairy farmer and here he would be 50 years later struggling with unpayable debts and worried about milk prices and pests and diseases on the farm. Instead, he was more content to be where the Lord wanted him and content with spitting cobras and the likes. But he had a good life with the Lord because he didn't run away. Don't run away from the Lord. And so uh, there's the question for you. Why will you run from 
God or when will you stop running from God? Phrase the question however is more, most appropriate to you. And then there's one final one. Will you grumble or will you pray? <clears throat> Joan and I have been reading through the Bible together, three chapters or so each night. We, this is our second time round. And we, excuse me, we're up to the book of Exodus again. And uh, we stumbled through the uh, plagues. They stumble because, oh, there's all sorts of horrible thoughts come through. How could this happen? When, when did that happen? It would be nice to have the book of Exodus as a three-volume trilogy or something. So you've got all the facts. Well, that's my mind coming through. But I've got all sorts of questions about the plagues. And then the actual escape at uh, the hand of Moses into the desert. Well, it wasn't really a desert. That's a mystery. A misinterpretation, if that's what your Bible says. I think the, the word is Mizpah, and it's not a desert at all. It's a wilderness. It's a wild country, maybe around Kobar, if you know that kind of country. Not quite desert, but ooh, not very pleasant. And so Moses led them out into that country there, when the Promised Land was there, they were wondering what on earth God was doing with them. And they started complaining. I think that's in about uh, Exodus 16 or something like that, that they started complaining. And uh, God got quite angry with them. But why shouldn't they complain? I mean, I was in the army for a few years, mind you, a weekend warrior, but, you know, we went out on bivouacs. And, uh, you know, the uh, commanding officers had to make sure that supplies were there for the soldiers to uh, use when they got there. It is true what they say, that a, an army marches on its stomach. If you can't provide the uh, victuals, the food and the water for your soldiers, you're in for a big defeat because the soldiers aren't going to have the will to fight. And this is, you know, I, if I was God, I would have had those train loads of supplies waiting. But God didn't take them out of Egypt in air-conditioned coaches at all. There was a million of them at that, more than a million of them too. How could anybody, even God, provide daily food for that many people? But he did. But... Uh, Unlike a military commander, he waited for them to ask. Now, instead of having it laid out at your feet day after day, we are asked to pray, Lord, give us today our daily bread. I don't know how we Australians would get on if we had to exodus Australia to go to Canaan <coughs> with God, because he wouldn't be there providing air-conditioned coaches for us, necessarily. He would be waiting for us to wait for Him. He would be waiting for us to ask. That's the way of the Lord. That's the adventure we're on, folks. No golden platter laid it out at, on our table day after day. Remember George Muller and his orphanages in uh, the UK? Quite often there was no food left. And uh, they had to sit down, all the children, and sit down with George Muller and pray, Lord, give us our food. And the Lord provided. He does. He does. These are lessons in life that we learn only by praying. We don't learn them by grumbling. Well, I've got a couple of references there. In fact, Philippians 2 verse 14 is not in your, in your notes, but you could write it down if you like. I'll quote it to you because I've got a bookmark in here as well. Philippians 2 verse 14. Uh, it is God who, verses verse 13, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. 
do everything 